AM 590, KXSP Omaha's ESPN Radio. It's time for the Metro's only racing talk show. The Front Stretch, presented by Joe's Karting and Council Bluffs. Now, here's Dan Taylor and Buddy Ray. Good morning, race fans, and welcome to the Front Stretch. It's the first show, what we dub the off-season. Uh, we're outside of the regular season for dirt track. NASCAR's done with. They're about to have their uh, their award ceremonies. And uh, But, uh, yeah, this is the first of the off-season. And uh, happy Thanksgiving. It's a little belated, but happy Thanksgiving to you. Did you have a good one, bud? <laughs> hey, that, that reminds me, by the way, the turkey chase. <laughs> Today's the last day for the t- That was, of all of your impressions, you know, we've banned you having an Australian accent, a British accent, any other thing other than accent. The turkey was actually a good impression. Don't try to do it again, because you're just going to ruin it. But uh, now I'm getting a little scatterbrained. Um, so, uh, did you have a good Thanksgiving? Yeah, oh yeah. Had a lot of turkey. Went over to Grandma Kinman's. Grandma Kinman is a sweet old lady, and uh, love going over there. And uh, It's just a great time sitting out with uh, Rachel and her family. And like I said, Grandma Kinman. Grandma Kim and I, we have a kind of a special relationship. Oh, boy. I don't even want to dive into that. Uh, we got a good show lined up for you today in turn one. Uh, we're going to kind of talk a little bit of news and notes, just kind of a little bit of banter, get you guys warmed up for the show of today. But the majority of the show is going to be in turns two through four. Turn two, we're going to talk with Craig Armstrong from Iowa Speedway. Uh, the sale is final. And NASCAR now owns our little track down the road uh, in Newton, Iowa, Iowa Speedway. So we'll talk Finally. to Craig about that. So we can put the rumors to rest. Yes. You and I did not we buy We didn't it. buy the. Nor, neither did Joe Kaziski. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I wish he was here because he, he just got so mad at me every time we made fun of him about that last year. Uh, in turns three and four, we're going to kick off the Legends of the Dirt series. I. Oh. My bad. No, it's okay. In, in turn three and four, we're going to kick off the Legends of the Dirt series. We're going to. Uh, we talked about Bill Martin, but I haven't had any luck getting a hold of him quite yet. So hopefully, now that the Thanksgiving Day is over with, and people are going to kind of get back into the motion of everyday life for the next couple of weeks till Christmas kicks in, uh, we'll be able to get a hold of him. But we got a great interview for you today. Uh, Doug Wolfgang Wolfie is going to join us. Uh, we're going to talk to him about his career. Oh, yeah. And, if, uh, you know, one of the things, if you go to the Joe's Carding Facebook page on Friday, we're doing trivia. Hmm. I'm going to tell you guys right now, like this week, there there was a trivia question. Um, it was a short story. Mm-hmm. And I actually did a fill in the blank trivia. So there was 10 blanks. So 10 people, the first person to guess each blank right, yeah. those 10 people got two free races to Joe's. Was this a short story according to everyone else or a short story according to you? No, this is actually a short story. Okay, according to everyone else. This, so it is a short story. Yeah, it's about a one, and a, <laughs> one or two paragraph story is all it is. But, you know, hey guys, listen to the front stretch. You might you know, be able to work uh, what we're talking about into the trivia. And uh, make sure to pay attention to the Facebook page for the Front Stretch uh, throughout the year. Uh, we just earlier this week posted the um, the event on the Facebook page for the Walk Down Sunset Lane at Quaker Steak and Lubin Council Bluffs on uh, January 22nd is when we're going to do the recording. That's a Wednesday night. We're going to start about 6 o'clock and we're going to record for probably about an hour and a half just to get enough audio, and then we'll edit it down and make sure we got a good solid hour-long show. Uh, and then after the recording's over with, we're all just going to kind of hang out and, and enjoy the, the night. So please come out. There'll be a, a fan microphone so you guys can come up and ask questions uh, to Craig Kelly. And uh, i got to get with Craig later this week to kind of figure out who these drivers are going to be because him and I have come up with a, a, a penciled-in list, but we got to get it finalized first. A couple things I'd like to mention real quick. Um to all of our new fans and followers yeah. on the Front Stretch Facebook page, um, as of this recording, 750 now. Nice. We have we have uh, eclipsed the 700 mark. I can't believe that many people like to follow us. Uh, well, they'll learn quickly. Uh, yeah, they'll, they'll learn quickly. <laughs> but hey, uh, you and I were talking about this. Uh, we were talking about the Legends of the Dirt. Uh, that's a real popular segment that yeah. we've done the last two years now. We're doing a Legends of the Marl. Mm-hmm. I tell you what, for all the listeners out there, we're trying to showcase today's younger drivers coming up. Help us, you know, it's, how do you... Here. Well, we, we want to rename it because a lot because some people have asked me, and you and I, when we were coming up with the name, we were concerned about this too, was that when you call somebody a legend of tomorrow, it's it's branding them with a lot of pressure. And, and maybe I'm going a little bit extreme, but I think it's kind of like the Danica Patrick thing. All the attention was on her when she won that poll at Daytona at the beginning of the year. And everyone that was 
a smart person said, guys, she won the poll at Daytona. Let's just back up and take it easy. And she had a rookie year. Nothing more, nothing less. So there was no need to put... There's What I'm trying to say is let's not put unneeded pressure on these drivers. And let's just call it something fun. You know, I, one name I'm kind of attached to... Uh, you, you disagree with it. That's perfectly fine. We we do that quite often. I like slingers of tomorrow. Sling and dirt of tomorrow. I like that. The slingers of tomorrow. I These like the, the stars guys. of tomorrow. See, and it's I just, we want to come up with something simple that won't put pressure on them, but will accent what they are going to be. These are the guys that are they're 18 and under, and gals, that are racing dirt right now and that we want to uh, kind of feature and just say, hey, keep your eye out for this girl. But you know what? At the same time, to be honest, if a lot of the people out there like the Legends of Tomorrow, let us know on the Front yeah. Stretch Facebook page. Let us know uh, if you have some great ideas as to what to rename it, or should we just leave it alone and go with it? So. To be honest with you, since our show is pre-recorded most nights, and it's going to be pre-recorded during the uh, the off season is that that's the best way to get a hold of us is via the Facebook page or to find us personally on Facebook. You can, you can fan me, on Dan Taylor, and you can fan Buddy. Yeah, I'm not real Buddy hard Ray to find. Jones. No, you're <laughs> everywhere. Uh, and then uh, one other little quick thing before Craig Armstrong is supposed to be calling in here in a few minutes. Uh, I want to talk about your dad, uh, formerly retired from being the crew chief of the number 25 Joe's Carding Sport Mod. Yeah, he, he's put in a lot of uh, years, a lot of good service, an incredibly smart guy. If it wasn't for my dad, I, I actually uh, wouldn't be where I'm at in today's uh, racing simply because he's shown me so much mechanically and, uh, and, and taught me how to kind of grow up at the racetrack and not take no BS from anybody. But with his health, he, he's pushing 70 years old. He's toking on the O2 bottle quite a bit now, as I tell everybody. He laughs about it. You know, everybody's he's going, not toking on the, He's still smoking cigarettes. Oh, Did yeah. he quit doing that? You're not supposed no. to do that with an oxygen. No. He still sits in his house with the furnace cranked up, electric space heater going, smoking two packs of Marlboros and a O2. You know, everybody's going pass, yeah. pass, yeah. You know, or puff, puff, pass. He's going... <laughs> You know, he's it, he's it, truly it, a delight, and uh, I, I always enjoy talking to him after the races at Crawford County and seeing him in the pits at Eagle and I-80, and, and just, he's going to be missed. Well, he just, he he's so wore out now that, he, you know, the, a lot of the nights, it's just too cold for him or it gets too hot for him, so Harley Meyer, yeah. everybody around here knows who Harley Meyer is. He's pretty much taken over the crew chief job, and trust me, he's not scared to kind of light my rear end up on are you, fire. Are you going to give him a pay raise so maybe next year he can afford the- uh, Yeah, I'm going to take him from nothing to nothing. <laughs> I mean, you're that's gonna, a, you're going to double his pay. Well, that's so I mean, nice. You're talking to the guy who likes to order off the dollar menu at McDonald's. I mean, yeah. <laughs> and you think you're getting extravagant when you do that. I'm telling you, I'm going to supersize that meal. You, you ought to see what happens when the McRibs come to town. <laughs> <laughs> no, but Harley's a great guy. Uh, he helps a lot. Uh, he's got the respect of a lot of teams. You know, Dad's going to be at the track from time to time. He's still going to go over to the shop and work on the cars from time to time. But as far as being at the shop every night and going to the track and the races each and every night and every week, mm -hmm. th that's not going to happen anymore, sadly. It, yeah, and it's it just it, we all get to that point in our lives, and there'll be a point when we're going to be too old to do this show. Hopefully, we can stay around that long. I'm going to be immortal. Nothing beats a butt. <laughs> I don't know. Something tells me there's going to be a wall that's going to claim you one of these days. It'll probably be Rachel. <laughs> she very well could be the end of you. Uh, so that's uh, that's uh, kind of just what we had to talk about so far. I tell you what, let's take a quick break. We're going to come back in turn two, talk with Craig Armstrong of Iowa Speedway, talk about the sale to NASCAR and what it means for the fans, what it means for 2015, 2016, and on. And then uh, we'll get to the Legends of the Dirt Series. We're kicking it off in style this week. Uh, Doug Wolfgang is going to join us in turns three and four, as well as Lee Ackerman. He'll come in the studio and help us uh, kind of talk to Doug about Doug's career. So hope you stick around. This is the Front Stretch. It's presented by Joe's Carding and Council Bluffs online at joescarding.com. That's carding with a K. This is Andrew from Kaziski Auto Parts. Kaziski Auto Parts is an insurance quality used parts supplier that can match your foreign or domestic car or truck needs. If you have a damaged or broke down car or truck, we guarantee a clean and quality part in next day fashion. Kaziski Auto Parts, your neighborhood premium recycled parts supplier. Call any Kaziski Auto Parts salesman today by dialing 402-731-4592 or visit us at 5040 I Street in Omaha. Kaziski Auto Parts, our quality used parts will match your car or truck's needs. Are you looking to book your next outing? Look no further than Joe's Carding in Council Bluffs. Located just north of Bass Pro, Joe's Carding can handle outings of well over 200 people. Bachelor parties, corporate outings, team meetings, birthday parties, and much more. Give Buddy a call today and reserve your outing. Joe's will even work with local restaurants to cater your event. 
Book yours today at joescarding.com. That's carding with a K. It's time to get to Joe's and find out what everyone already knows. We're working the high line into turn two on the front stretch. Presented by Joe's Carding. Online at joescarding.com. Welcome back to the front stretch. Heading into turn two. Brought to you by Joe's Carding at Council Bluffs. Online at joescarding.com. That is carding with a K. And uh, I know we just talked to him what seemed like it was two weeks ago, I think. Uh, Craig Armstrong of Iowa Speedway joins us again to formally announce the big news for you guys over there at our favorite little track down the road. Well, as uh, many of you may have already heard, and it was announced uh, out of Daytona Beach that uh, NASCAR, yes, you heard it correctly, NASCAR purchased Iowa Speedway. And to say that we are delighted about that would be the understatement, at least of this, this part of the century. And we are thrilled to welcome NASCAR uh, to America's Place to Race and uh, all of the expertise, all of the really the experience and the background and the seasoning of the number one motorsport in the world are brought to bear at, uh, on Iowa Speedway and Newton. We're just we're thrilled, to say the least. What does this mean for Iowa Speedway? Obviously, the 2014 set schedule is set in stone. And everyone's asking the same thing. When are we going to get a cup race? When are we going to get a cup race? Can we read the the lines in the sand and say that we're closer to a cup race in 2015 or 2016? I don't think you can do that really uh, realistically at this point. Now, that that landscape could change very quickly. But you've got to understand that NASCAR has not gone in and just arbitrarily taken a race from a, a, another racetrack and said, now we're going to put this over here or we're going to open up that market over there. Uh, they've taken a, a really kind of a long view of this thing and and let the marketplace sort of dictate that. And I... I uh, yeah. And, and this is this is just Craig's opinion, but I, it really is going to need to be a situation where another racetrack or racetrack operator says, "Look, we've we've got a track here that is would do exceptionally well with one race, but we have two, and they're not doing as well as we'd like." And maybe there's some advantages to to cutting back to one, and then that race goes back to NASCAR. Uh, the, I, I think under those circumstances, you know, we would be in an advantageous position, but I don't, I don't see, first of all, and, and the German Brian Francis made it very, very clear that the schedule is not going to be expanded, not going to add a, you know, a 37th or a 38th race to an already crowded and very busy and very long and taxing Sprint Cup Series schedule. We're just not mm-hmm. going to do it. And, and, and there's good and valuable reason from sponsors, from the fan perspective, from certainly the drivers and teams, and all of the operating logistics, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. So that situation will play out in an, in its own good time. The whole idea now for us is let's let's get back to basics and then use those good basics that we have available to us through the resources of NASCAR to build the best program we possibly can in 2014 and beyond. We'll have an NASCAR Nationwide Series race, two of them, in fact, one in May, one in, in August, early August. We will have a, a, an IndyCar race that's now been expanded to 300 laps, the Iowa Corn Indy 300, plus the uh, Friday night. That'll be on a Saturday night, the uh, uh, 12th of, of July. And on, on Friday night, the 11th of July, the NASCAR Camping World Truck Series, first time ever we've paired them up with the IndyCar Series. This has kind of been a personal dream of mine to do what uh, what Texas has done so successful at Texas Motor Speedway in Fort Worth is, is put those two things together and it seems to me that they complement one another very well because they draw from different market segments and I think that the net result is going to be that there'll be some NASCAR fans that say, hey, this IndyCar thing ain't too bad and there'll be some mm-hmm. IndyCar fans that'll look at uh, the NASCAR Camping World Truck Series and say, those guys get up on the wheel and get with it. <laughs> they really put on a show. They absolutely and play do. Both under the lights, and uh, you know, I mean, it's just going to be a terrific weekend. As will both of the NASCAR Nationwide Series weekends in mid-May and, and early August, coupled up with the NASCAR K and N Pro Series East versus West Challenge Series. Though, you know, I mean, the, the, the future stars of NASCAR are all coming out of the K and N Pro Series. Mm-hmm. I mean, look at all of them: you know, Chase Elliott and, and uh, Bubba Wallace. I mean, the, the list goes on and on and on. Ryan uh, uh, Blaney. I mean, they're they're all 
uh, stars in that series that move on to something else, and then obviously their their ultimate objective is cup. But man, we're catching all the rising stars as they're coming out of the woodwork. Season tickets still available for ninety five dollars, starting oh, at ninety five dollars. Starting at ninety five dollars, absolutely, and uh, they are. This is the t- the prime time. I mean, to secure the best seat that you can in the grandstands. We are giving courtesy to our existing season ticket holders to the 14th of December to uh, re-secure their seats, the ones that they currently have, the one from, from 13, uh, for the 14th season. But uh, mm-hmm. there are plenty of still great seats available for those who do not have a season ticket but would like to get in on the action now that uh, there's some uh, very, very bright horizons in the future for Iowa Speedway. And, uh, you know, and just, again, that, that fan experience, that entertainment value, the ability to, to take the best learnings of the motorsports entertainment business in this country and focus them on uh, Iowa Speedway and, uh, you know, to service that upper Midwest market the way we do and expand it, you know, to where, you know, we've got a lot of race fans that make the two-and-a-half, three-hour drive over from the Omaha Council Bluffs area. For every one of our races, and, and we hope that number continues to expand. And I think as we really uh, the reputation of the track continues to grow, and people see what uh, the real value of of having that asset in the Upper Midwest will be. I mean, we've got sixty million dollars plus of economic impact that uh, inures to every every year from mm-hmm. from Iowa Speedway. We're bringing people into this part of the country where. They've never dis- they would have never darkened our door. I mean, they would have never thought of you know, Iowa and the, and the upper Midwest was kind of a flyover area or a drive through area, not a destination. So there's a lot of great things. Even if you're not a rich fan, there's a lot of great things about having a strong, financially stable, growing, and, uh, and forward-thinking operation in Newton, Iowa, at Iowa Speedway. And by the way, those season tickets you mentioned, um, they are available right now online at iowaspeedway.com. And you said, of course, that they do start as little as 95 bucks for the full season, including a complimentary fan walk pass to the Casey's Fan Walk, um, which mm. is a great value. I mean, that's $10 per show. There's $60 right there Yeah. Uh, in the complimentary passes available to you, plus all kinds of perks that only season ticket holders have. Uh, give us a call at 866-RUSTY-GO. That's 787-8946 for the alphanumeric challenged and uh, listen, me <laughs> we're going to have a blast next year but we're going to have a hell of a lot of fun in the meantime just talking about this and you know i, I said the word the magic word rusty he is still going to be deeply involved with the track and uh he's already talking about some things he's going to do to uh help us enhance the product and uh and just kind of spread the word about how important it is and how incredibly significant it is that NASCAR is now in control of Iowa Speedway. Very excited about the news of NASCAR purchasing the track. I think you're absolutely right. It does open up a lot of avenues for extra entertainment, not just what you see on the track when the green flag waves, but the stuff you're going to see before and after. So, Craig, have a great holiday season, and uh, we can't wait to talk to you again soon. Happy Thanksgiving to you guys and, of course, to all of your listeners. And, uh, listen, we're, we're going to have a great holiday uh, coming up uh, this whole weekend as well as uh, the uh, – the upcoming Christmas season. So you guys have a great time, and uh, listen, we'll be talking down the road for sure. All right, can't wait. Thanks, Craig. Have a good one. Again, Craig Armstrong of Iowa Speedway. All right, how about we go and uh, talk with uh, Doug Wolfgang from for uh, for the Legends of the Dirt series? Sounds good to All me. Right, we'll be back with Doug Wolfgang here in a few minutes. It's back again this year. Make memories at Quaker Steak and Lube on Monday, December 16th, and have dinner with Santa. Mr. and Mrs. Claus love the lube, and your family will too, with free photos with Santa. And the kids could win one of three Razor scooters we're giving away. Don't forget, stock up on the lube gift cards, the perfect stocking stuffer. Dinner with Mr. and Mrs. Claus, Monday, December 16th, from 5 until 8 p.m. And don't forget, kids eat free with an adult purchase. Quaker Steak and Lube, next to the Mid-America Center, Council Bluffs. 
Are you ready for fast-paced, adrenaline-pumping, wheel-to-wheel racing right here in the Metro? Get to Joe's Karting in Council Bluffs and see what it's like to race real go-karts. Joe's Karting knows it's no fun to race go-karts at 10 miles per hour, so they ripped the governors out, and now the only restriction is how good you are at racing. It's full-throttle, white-knuckle racing every day of the week. Head over to joeskarting.com for hours, prices, and specials, or give Buddy a call today and set up your group races at 712-256-5278. Time to grab another tear-off and make your move. We're headed into turn three on the front stretch, presented by Joe's Carding. Welcome back to the front stretch, heading into turn three, and it's time for the Legends of the Dirt Series, brought to you by Kaziski Auto Parts, 51st and I Street in Omaha, online at KaziskiAutoParts.com. 731-4592 is the number you can call to get a hold of anybody over at Kaziski Auto Parts and get yourself quality used parts from Team PRP at an affordable price. The Legends of the Dirt Series continue when we're talking with The Wolf. Doug Wolfgang on the phone with us. Doug, thanks so much for taking your time. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Doug, you are a, a, a big sprint car fan, and uh, Lee Ackerman is, is probably uh, is a big uh, fan of yours, so I, I'm going to hand a lot of this interview over to Lee. and Lee, you can kind of talk a little bit about maybe the first time you saw Doug race. The first time I remember Doug Wolfgang was at the Nebraska State Fair, and he was driving a car number 91. I think they had 91 on one side, nothing on the other. He went flying off turn three, and we all thought, who the hell is this guy? And I think a year or two later, he had 45 wins in a national championship with Bob Trostel. So <laughs> it didn't take long for us to find out who Doug Wolfgang was. <laughs> Doug, do you remember that? Well, yeah, I, I do now. <laughs> I hit my head really hard that day. All I remember is Opperman came over and you two came walking back together into the pits. Yeah, he was... Uh, he, he kind of took a liking to me a little bit, uh, and him and a couple of other guys, you know, that hung around him, and and uh, he was kind of coaching me, mentoring me, or whatever you want to call it, and uh, I didn't quite impress him too much that day. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, he gave you more shots, though, right? Oh, yeah, I, I am very lucky. He gave me more shots, definitely, after that, yeah. Talk about the start of your career, Doug. How did you get into racing? Was it a family thing, or was it something that you were a first generation? Well, my dad took me to the races all the time when I was a kid, and I I kind of remember, you know, when I was 10, 12 years old, we went every Sunday night, and we I grew up in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And in those days, the modifieds were, big, were a big thing all over the country, and we had a great modified track here in town. Uh, yeah, a couple of them, for that matter. Uh, you know, they were all 32 Ford Coupes with V8s in them, and uh, they evolved later. You know, later on, they all all those modifieds evolved into sprint cars. So, uh, you know, no matter where you came from, uh, you got a good training ground to drive a sprint car. But and so he took me every Sunday night, and I kind of remember that he worked a job uh, like everybody did, and he couldn't come at 3 o'clock after school and watch me play basketball or football, but he would, but he was with me going to the racetrack. He took me to the racetrack every Sunday night, and I just thought that that was something that uh, me and him could do together, and I liked it. Uh, you know, he, he was my hero, one, you know, my hero like, like everybody grows up idolizing their dads, you know, and... Mm-hmm. But he didn't, he didn't, he wasn't into racing. He didn't have a car. He just took me as a fan. And then as time evolved and I got to be 13, 14, 15 years old, you know, about that time, you know, those people got a week's vacation or two weeks vacation every, every year. And they would take it in the summer. And when your kids get a little older, they don't want to go. Well, my dad fixed that easy because he took, he would take his vacation on Labor Day weekend, and the only thing we did was go watch sprint car races all over. Uh, we went to, uh, you know, as far away as Illinois and Missouri, and, uh, you know, and so it was a thing that we did together, and I just grew up wanting to be a race race driver. We, we moved to Beloit, Wisconsin, 
when I was a sophomore in high school, and I remember having a study hall, and one of the study halls was in the library, and Beloit is only about 80 miles away from uh, uh, Chicago, and and every day I would read the paper in the spring in study hall, this, and they would get the Chicago paper and the Indianapolis Star. Well, I remember reading about the Indianapolis 500 back in them days, and uh, which would be 1964 uh, or five, you know, in that area. And all, and the guys that were my heroes of the day were, were A.J. Foyt, Johnny Rutherford, you know, Parnelli Jones, and those type of guys in the era of just. Just at the change of the rear engine cars, they were some of them were still running roasters, and they would have big articles in the paper at the time. And that's the only thing I studied at study hall was the Indianapolis Star <laughs> because it had the most about racing. <laughs> and, and it became apparent to me that all these guys were learning how to drive Indianapolis cars by going to the state fair tracks and driving sprint cars. And I knew what they were because my dad took me to them. And so I got it in my mind at about 13, 14 years old that I was going to be an Indy star. I was going to make a million dollars, and I was going to win Indianapolis. <laughs> and, and and the way to do that was to learn my trade at the dirt tracks across the Midwest in a sprint car. And as soon as I could win, uh, you know, a sprint car race, uh, I'd get, I'd get uh, hired by an Indy car driver, and another year or so, when I learned I caught on to drive any cars, I'd win that baby, and then I'd be, I'd be a millionaire, and I yeah. wouldn't have to work at the local, uh, you know, the packing plant, uh, uh, you know, and and I didn't really want to do that anyway. So I thought, well, hell, I'm going to do this. It's the greatest, you know. My dad liked it, and yeah. I was pumped up on it. So well, that's how I got started. You were hoping to you, to make yourself uh, win a million dollars doing all this racing and doing that stuff, but did, at what time did it occur to you that it was going to cost you a million and one dollars to get to that point? It didn't take long. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because obviously there's nobody going to hire you when you've never even put a helmet on, you know. And so like everybody else, you have to go get you a job or whatever you do and build your own, you know, and buy or build your own race car. And and I had already started hanging around local racers, and I, I knew a little bit about the cars, very little, but I mean I knew already that it was not just peaches and cream. You worked on them, and, you know, it took a lot of work, and in those days, you just didn't, uh, you know, get on the phone and uh, and call Speedway Motors and buy everything right off the showroom floor and bolt it together. Uh, you know, a lot of the old modified, dirt track modifieds and, you know, and the sprint car stuff was home-built stuff that you, you, you know, you learned how to do from trial and error method. And so while I was in high school, I realized I needed to learn that stuff. So I went to, uh, you know, I, I, I did the Votech part of high school and took machine shop and welding and, uh, and that kind of stuff. And I actually built my first modified in pieces in my, my junior and senior year in high school. I'd put the front, you know, get the front end and the steering gear and the rear end and the drive line. And and the and the teachers loved it because I was learning how to do the stuff I was doing, and I liked it because I got to work on what I wanted to work on, and I took it home then piece by piece. And after a while, uh, you know, I had a complete car to get. I had to build the frame at home, but you know, I, all my pieces were made then. So yeah. that's how I got started. Go back to getting started. How hard was it for you to get into, actually get into turning your first set of laps? Actually, my first set of laps was in an old 37 Dodge Coupe that a local guy up here had sitting out in a shelter belt. It used to be an old modified back in the 50s. And by the time I got out of high school in 1970, I, was, I graduated at 17 years old. And just about the time I got out of high school, there was a local little tavern that a lot of race people hung out at. And I was up there one Sunday afternoon, and, and I was up there enough 
that the owners never even asked me for an identification because I was still only 17. And they had a pitch game going, and I won this race car in a pitch game. Well, it didn't have no motor, and it was totally junk. But I had an old an old motor out of a out of a uh, I don't know. I at the time I was working a job at a at a salvage yard here in town, and I probably had a motor for a, a V8 Chevy out of a salvage car that I'd gotten, you know, for little or nothing. And I I got it up in there and, you know, kind of, there was no motor mounts for it. So I just kind of put it on a floor jack and put it inside this chassis and weld, slobber welded a bunch of plates on it to bolt the motor in there. Is this, and we is, got it going. Is slobber, know, welding, and, is slobber welding a technical term? It, it was junk, I can tell you that. <laughs> I didn't know nothing, you know. And plus, the stuff was all rusted anyway, you know, so. Yeah, anyway, uh, sorry. <laughs> that's how I first got started, and, and it was it was uh, far from being, uh, you know, the best sprint car in the country, let alone an Indy car, so, uh, you know. But all them people, everybody that races, ha- that has raced, has a story like that so that's you know that's just the way it, everybody starts so doug it seems to me that you're as i mentioned earlier your career took off when you went to drive for bob trostel tell us a little bit about that well actually i i raced the modified up here and i got and i was getting pretty good by the time i was i started racing when i was 18 i guess or right away you know pretty close to that anyway and i raced and I also got married and had a couple of kids, so, I, you know, <laughs> I didn't have no money, and I was completely broke, and I, I got into driving another guy's car up here, and I got to be fairly good, and then a friend of mine from down in Sioux City did race up here with me, too, a guy named Dick Morris, and and Dick had bought a sprint car from Don Maxwell in Lincoln, Nebraska, who built cars for Opperman and stuff. And he was going to take this sprint car in the fall of the year to the Western World Championships in in Phoenix. And I saw him. They had a little uh, little party at the local racetrack, a year-end party uh, after the race season was over. And it wasn't a banquet. It was just a get-together where guys played cards and, you know, and jacked around and, and it was in the middle of October and he said, Hey, I'm go or, uh, first of October. He said, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to go to Phoenix to this race. He said, you know, if, if you could get off work, you, you want to come with me? It won't cost you nothing. You can sleep out in my butt. He had an old school bus hauling it down there, you know, won't cost you nothing. I'll buy your pit pass if you help me. Well, hell, I was so green, I hadn't hardly heard of the Western World Championships, let alone knowing, you know, at that time, it was one of the, the top three uh, outlaw sprint car event. There wasn't World of Outlaws yet, but, you know, right. a non-sanctioned sprint car event, the Knoxville Nationals, the Western World Championships, and the Pacific Coast Nationals at Ascot were the, were the big three uh, sprint car events. So, I mean, I was a total rookie, but I did get off work, and I rode down there with him. And uh, in the process, this Dick Morris knew that I could weld and could, could you know, fabricate metal. And, and trust me, I wasn't, I wasn't no uh, A.J. Watson or nobody like that, or Don Maxwell, for that matter. But Maxwell building his car, and Maxwell was going to need some help, somebody in Lincoln, Nebraska, somebody to come in and help build cars, you know, fabricate little parts or whatever. And so he said, Hey, I, I know uh, this guy with me here, Doug Wolfgang, he wants, he want he, he's a good fabricator and he wants to kind of race and get down around all these sprint car people. Anyway, you ought to hire him. Well, he, he wasn't really interested and I don't blame him because I didn't look like much, <laughs> uh, you know, yeah. and, uh, but I, but I kept calling him and then I finally drove down there and asked him and bugged him to death and, and he gave me a job. Well, it, you know, and I was more interested in, in getting a sprint car to drive than I was working on him. And after a, you know, 
after a year or so, I finally decided that I'd had enough and it wasn't going to get, you know, I was starving to death. He wasn't paying me that much, but he told me what he was, was going to pay. And he paid me the, uh, the fair amount that he told me. It was just that by that time I had two kids and I was starving and I had to start, think, you know, I could see yeah. that I wasn't going to make it. So I was going to move home. And about that time, Bob Trossel called Maxwell on the phone and he wanted to, Maxwell built these plastic fuel tanks that became the rage. Uh, Snyder fiberglass in, in Lincoln, Nebraska makes those, uh, you know, I think they still make those big tanks like sprayer tanks, mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and stuff that farmers use and different people use. Well, they also had them. Maxwell made a mold and made a made a nice plastic tank for a few, you know, for a sprint car, and it was way cheaper and a lot safer than the aluminum ones that cracked and leaked fuel all over at, in those days, you know, like 1974 or so when I, when I went down there, or, you know, when I was going down there. But it, and so Bob was going to buy about five of these tanks from Maxwell, and Ma and he got to talking. Well, you know, back and forth. What are you going to do this year? It was in the spring, you know, and or I no, it was actually in February. What are you going to do this year in racing? And you know, blah blah blah, back and forth. And well, uh, Bob said, "Well, my welder quit. He's going to go into business on his own." So. I got to get me a welder. My driver quit after Florida. I need to hire a driver. And Maxwell just said off the cuff, he said, why don't you hire Doug Wolfgang? He can weld real good. He arc real good. And he wants to drive sprint cars. And I had already run the year before, 1974. And this was going to be for the spring. No, I had run in 75. And this was going to be for the spring of 1976. Okay. And Bob said, well, I've seen him run, and he's 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 a good driver, I think. He hasn't been in a real good car yet. And, and he said, but can he weld? And Maxwell said, well, he's, he's an excellent welder, but he'll tell you he can drive race cars better. <laughs> but, you know, because kids are that way. So so he got, he said, well, put him on the phone. And, and so I got on the phone, and, and Trossel said, well, Maxwell told me that you're thinking about moving back to Sioux Falls anyway, so I don't, I don't, you know, I'm not trying to hire you away from him, but if you're going to do that, why don't you think about coming over here and working for me full time and driving my sprint car? Well, you know, he had had Dick Sutcliffe and, you know, the year before and lots of guys in his car and it was, a, it was a decent car. He's the guy that brought Offerman onto the scene in the, you know, four or five years earlier. Uh, and and gave him a chance to where he got going good, and so I knew of Bob Trossel. I didn't know him, but I knew of him, but I didn't know much about him. And so I went over there that Saturday, and his car was sitting there ready to race because they had already went to Florida, and it was somebody else. And uh, I could, I looked at the race car, and I didn't even care about the shop. I was, I told him I'll go to work. Anytime he wants me to, I want to drive that car. <laughs> he had and, it looking and, pretty and, for you. Well, it wasn't. It wasn't pretty, but it was definitely better than anything I'd ever driven. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of the ones I had gotten into earlier than that, and uh, you know, you needed a tetanus shot to be in them. And, and actually, they, the car needed a tetanus shot for me to sit in it because I was not. <laughs> I was not too swift, you know. Worried you were going to catch so, rabies or something? Yeah, uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I was not. Uh, you know, I wouldn't say I was very smooth and and, and technical or anything like that. In fact, I didn't. I'm kind of like Cole Trickle in the movie. They, and when he told him to go back out there and run over the space car because it's the only thing he missed, I didn't even miss a pace car. <laughs> We're talking so, with Doug Wolfgang, a legendary sprint car driver throughout the Midwest. Doug, we got to take a quick break. We're going to come back and uh, talk, uh, get a little bit more in depth about your career. We'll be right back here on the front stretch. 
We have all been there before. Broken car part in your hand and some snot-nosed punk behind the counter has no idea what he is talking about, but he guarantees that this part will fix your car. You pay an arm and a leg for the replacement, get it home, and sure enough, it doesn't fit your car. Now, learn from your mistake and give an experienced salesperson at Kasiski Auto Parts a call today at 402-731-4592. Kasiski Auto Parts will get you back on the road with your arms and legs still attached. Are you ready for fast-paced, adrenaline-pumping, wheel-to-wheel racing right here in the Metro? Get to Joe's Karting in Council Bluffs and see what it's like to race real go-karts. Joe's Karting knows it's no fun to race go-karts at 10 miles per hour, so they ripped the governors out, and now the only restriction is how good you are at racing. It's full-throttle, white-knuckle racing every day of the week. Head over to joeskarting.com for hours, prices, and specials, or give Buddy a call today and set up your group races at 712-256-5278. Get ready for the victory lap as we make our way into turn four on the front stretch. Presented by Joe's Karting. Online at joeskarting.com. All right, heading into turn four, and we're going to continue our Legends of the Dirt series. I'm Dan Taylor, joined by Lee Ackerman and, as always, Buddy Ray Jones. Buddy driving the number uh, 25 Sport Mod. Uh, I-80 Speedway is where you're going to be racing, uh, sounds like, so far this year, and then kind of a touring the rest of the time. Yeah, we're going to be racing I-80 Speedway. We're going to try to tame the high banks of that track. You know, I'm going to make spinning out look good this year. <laughs> and then you on you Saturday, certainly tried your best at Crawford last year. Yep. And then on <laughs> Saturday and Sunday nights, we're going to maybe tour around a little bit and just kind of, you know, just have fun. And, have fun. You know, not chase yeah. points, get out and meet new people, stuff like that. We're continuing our Legends of the Dirt series, brought to you by Kaziski Auto Parts, 51st and Ice Street, 731-4592. You can call Andrew Kaziski today and pick up a quality used part at an affordable price, backed by Team PRP, Premium Recycled Parts. And uh, obviously the Kaziskis, big figures in the dirt track world. Uh, d- talking with Doug Wolfgang, we're continuing our second segment, talking with Doug... Doug, did you ever get a chance to race out of I-80 Speedway? I, the track was actually made uh, after I got burnt and, oh. and and was done. But I have raced there a couple times since then. But I was it wasn't World of Outlaws or nothing. You know, it was just local racing. And actually, I've won a couple races in Mark Birch's car back in the middle 90s. Exactly, the 1M uh, car. Yeah, the 1M car. Hmm. And uh, and my son has been there, I don't know, ten or twelve times since he started racing a little bit, and he li- he likes that racetrack a lot. So before we took uh, a break, we were talking about you getting your start with Bob Trussell Racing, uh, driving to number twenty in nineteen seventy seven. You claimed forty five wins, and you got your first no- Na- uh, Knoxville Nationals Championship. Talk about that win a little bit. Actually, the win was anticlimactic because. We had won a lot of races before that, and when I hot lapped that night and start, you know, I kind of thought we were going to, I could tell we were going to drive, we were good to go. We were handling good, and we were going to drive away, and we did. It was it was really no contest, and, and, and that's good and bad because in, it was good that night, but bad because I got to thinking that maybe I was God the Father Almighty. Oh. <laughs> And that I could win it at will and anywhere I wanted to, and it's not that way in racing. Yeah. The funny thing is, is that when I got with Bob, I didn't hardly know him, nor did I know anybody in racing, nor did I know anything about racing. But as all race drivers or car owners or sponsors know, saying you want to do something is one thing, and getting lined up with the proper people around you to get it done is a total different situation. And you you can have all the money in the world and and four or five great mechanics, and sometimes it just don't work out. Mm-hmm. Or the next time you can have half the money you need and a bunch of gray tape and bailing wire holding the race car together and win night after night because the one or two people working together just click off, and that's what happened to me and Bob. Uh, and we're still friends. Bob is, you know, 80, 84 two years old now and and we're still buddies uh and he didn't when he hired me he was uh 40 in his upper 40s and i was barely you know 23 or 22 and uh just just a kid you know and yet he he 
he made me feel wanted, made me feel important, made me feel like I was part of his race team, and we just clicked. And and uh, after a year of of racing 1976, we built us a nice car, and it was lightweight as you could be, you know. And in those days, nobody knew what lightweight was. Uh, we we just kind of figured that the biggest motor pulling the least amount of weight would accelerate faster, and so. We just tried to have the best engine we could with the lightest car mm-hmm. available. And and we just uh, had a car that was unbelievable, and it fitted my driving, and Bob kind of kept it the way I liked it. And so when we actually got to the Knoxville Nationals, we were really ready to win it, and we did. And so it was kind of anticlimactic. Doug, the next year you went to Bill, moved back to Lincoln and ran for Bill Smith in the 4X, and it reminds me of a story I think the vi- viewers would be interested in. You were out in Skagit, Washington, Thursday, Friday, Saturday show, and you won the Northwest Dirt Classic. Pete Lycom had a special the following Wednesday in Lincoln, so I go down to the special thinking I'm going to see my favorite driver, Doug Wolfgang, and he's not there. So I asked one of the guys in the pits where he's at and he said he came through town on monday they're racing in orville ohio tonight so you guys had won in skag and went all the way across the country for your next race did you do a lot of that well we did that in them days we did in fact we went actually we went to orville on tuesday i think it was tuesday and it might it might have been wednesday but and the next night we went to port royal pennsylvania Jeez. they had a uh when did it's you sleep? 70. We didn't. We slept in the truck in them days <laughs> and drove all night. And uh, one of my better friends in racing, and still is, is Keith Kaufman of Mifflin Town, Pennsylvania. And uh, I met Keith that night at Port Royal for the first time, and that was in the in early June of 1978. And and I got my indoctrination in 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 wing sprint car racing them guys run tough out there and i all you know and i learned it that night so i remember that and that's where we were going but we did stop in orville ohio on tuesday we're talking or with whatever days days it was we're talking with the legend uh, the wolf doug wolfgang here on the front stretch uh, doug what is your favorite win of all time one that sits above the rest i had a lot of wins and around 550 around because I don't really know. I kept I kept track for a while, but I never did at the end. And so they kind of run together. All races kind of ran together for me. And as time went on, the funny thing is, is that most of the people that race sprint cars would give their right arm to win the Knoxville Nationals. And I won the Knoxville Nationals five times, but I won it in 1977 for Bob Trossel, and I've raced so many races since then, around 2,000 more, before I got injured and, you know, and didn't do it much, especially professionally after that. I raced so many races and so many starts that now when I think back on it, I can't even remember that night. I, I know what we did. I know what we had on for tires. I know what our setup was. But I don't have recall of of the race, you know, beforehand and afterwards on the victory podium. And that saddens me because most people would give their left arm or right arm to, to win that race. And it makes me sound pompous or whatever the word is. But trust me, I'm not that way. I just raced so much that I can't remember. And that does sad, sadden me. But my, my favorite of all time race was... And you wouldn't understand this because in 1984, I had switched around several race cars to drive. I had been through Gambler Chassis the year before and then Nance earlier in the year. And Nance quit and fired me or whatever. And it looked like my career was actually coming to an end. And I was uh, 31 or two years old Hmm. at the time. 31 when it started to happen early in the season. But by the Knoxville National time, I was 32, and Bob Weikert called me about a month before the Knoxville Nationals, and actually I had no desire to drive a car from Pennsylvania unless he would run some of the 
some of the big World of Outlaw races, of which he promised me he would. The Kings Royal, the the Knoxville Nationals, the you know the yeah. some of the races in California, the Syracuse Super Nationals, and all that stuff. And so I went to drive for him, and and the first week I drove for him, I got fast time at the Kings Royal, which I was happy with. But we didn't really hit it right in the feature. But the next week. I won the Knoxville Nationals with him, and it was seems like my career was coming to an end, and yet I won the biggest race of the year. And I can remember thinking, "Oh my God, I am lucky!" You know, I'm so yeah. lucky to drive this car. I thought I was going to be. I kind of thought I might be done, even. I, you know, driving the real good cars, but I got in that car, and it was, you know, and then I was in it for another four years, and we won two more. One more Knoxville National, but several races, 150 about. So uh, we we that one I did definitely remember, and it was just because not so much of Knoxville, not so much of Weikert's car, but just because I thought at that moment my career was at a standstill and it might be over. So it was it was kind of a it was a. Um... I don't want to put a very sweet moment for you because you felt like maybe yeah. you were down and out, but you made it made your way yeah, back. Yeah, I, I, I thought I had peaked already, and that I wasn't really going to get a chance to do much more. Hmm. You know, and I, and it, and it, and it, and then it just opened up the floodgate, and I and I had six or seven. Well, until 1992, when I got hurt, I had I had several more good seasons, and I think I could have had ten more yet. But I got hurt, and that's just the way it is. So, is there a favorite dirt track that you have? Maybe it's the in the Knoxville Speedway. Maybe it's a, it's a track in Pencil, in somewhere in the country that just seems to fit your style. Is there a track you love going race at? Well, I, I you know, for me, I I guess I developed a style of running straight and fairly smooth, and, and at least that's what other people have told me. I just did it the way I it came to me. But my style adhered to big, fast racetracks like Knoxville, like Parkersburg, West Virginia, like uh, uh, Syracuse, like uh, Sillins Grove, Port Royal, Williams Grove, uh, Eldora Speedway. And they all have big races, you know, Williams Grove Open, uh, the Kings Royal, the Knoxville Nationals, Syracuse Super Nationals. But when people ask me that question, I tell them my favorite track is Houston Speedway in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. <laughs> and they always ask, why is that? And I say, because it's five miles from my house. <laughs> it's, not, it's not 18 hours. And, yeah. it, and it isn't a big half mile either. <laughs> no, it's a very short track. <laughs> yeah. Well, Doug, uh, I think we've uh, taken up quite a bit of your time. We, we do appreciate it. Uh, one final question for you. We're kind of asking a lot of this of the legends, but uh, if you have one driver that you've raced against, or maybe it was someone that you watched uh, through your career, who would you nominate as someone that would be a legend in your book? In my book, I've been lucky enough to race against all of them, almost. I mean, Steve and Sammy and Lasoski and... Uh, you know, from our area, Rick Ferkel, Bobby Allen, Stevie Smith, you know, mm -hmm. uh, all that kind of stuff. But I have a lot of, I, I even, uh, I even was friends with Dale Earnhardt, you know, uh, Rick Mears. So I don't have one guy that I would, would say that of. I just know how hard it is most people think that these race car drivers had got have god given talent and and let's face it some have a little more god given talent than others and, and and they are great race car drivers because of the god given talent but it's not just that i know how incredibly hard and how much focus and how how lucky you know, all that kind of thing works into it to be a great race car driver, and I have admiration for. I, I have admiration for not only all those good guys, but I admire even local racers that you don't know much about. Mm -hmm. You know, like I, I'm friends with several guys that uh, I remember. I won the Syracuse Super Nationals once in the middle '80s, and Bobby Allison was up there doing the interview, and there's twenty-seven thousand fans. In the, 
in the grandstand at Syracuse, New York State Fairgrounds racetrack. And he said, uh, you know, and and they're 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 interviewing me on Saturday because they're talking about the, uh, the 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 dirt track modified race that Bobby Allison, Jeff Bodine, Kenny Schrader, and several of them guys are in the next day, Dave Blaney and what have you. And so they want me to kind of plug that in the interview, and they got Bobby Allison up there, the great NASCAR driver, and he's also a friend of mine. He says, Doug, who's your favorite, uh, who would be your favorite race car driver tomorrow to win the, the Syracuse 150? And I'm supposed to say, well, you, Bobby, who else? You know? And I said, Marty, I said, Marty Barber. And he said, Marty Barber, uh, what car does he drive? I said, well, he don't here. He's not here. He drives a street stock in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. But he's my favorite race car driver of all time. <laughs> <laughs> and Bobby Allison loved it. In fact, remember when he got hurt at Pocono and he, he got hit real hard and was definitely injured to the bitter end and mm-hmm. he lost his mind and could, you know, had brain surgery and all that. Well, they all, the big thing about him was he forgot everything he learned, you know. Mm-hmm. He couldn't remember his birthday. He couldn't remember winning the Daytona 500. He couldn't remember nothing. Well, I seen him about three years after his accident in Phoenix at the NASCAR race. Yeah. And he saw me walking walking about 20 yards away and he yelled at me hey Doug I turn around he's waving at me he said hey how's your buddy Marty Barber <laughs> I knew he, was fine, you know? yeah. he never forgot that wow sure. <laughs> that, so that's some I, story I can't you love. answer one name I, yeah. I would say I, I have admiration for every race car driver out there in their own way well, that's I know a... exactly how hard it I know how hard it is it's not easy to be a race driver, not only financially, but everything involved in it. It's hard on your family. It's hard on your wife. You know, it, it's, it's just not easy. Mm-hmm. And yet a lot of these guys love it. They give up everything to do it, and I did it the same way. Can't be said any better than that. Doug Wolfgang, legendary driver throughout the Midwest, big-time winner, won uh, well over 500 uh, races through his career, uh, Knoxville Nationals, uh, just won about everything you can win. Doug, we appreciate your time and uh, sitting down with us as a part of the Legends of the Dirt Series. No sweat. Thanks for having me. Oh, Doug Wolfgang, I tell you, really nice guy. He's a character. He is a character. All right, we're going to wrap this show up. Uh, Freddie Smith next weekend. John Anderson still to come. We've also got Ed Sanger, Kenny Schrader, the walk down Sunset Lane. Don't forget to mark your calendars. January 22nd, it's a Wednesday night. We're going to be recording that show at Quaker Steak and Lube in Council Bluffs. You can get more information on the Front Stretch Facebook page, and we'll be talking more about it as the year goes on. So we hope you can join us for the walk down Sunset Lane, January 22nd, and we will replay that show on February. February 2nd. So a lot of great legends still left to come, Lee. But uh, let's call it a Sunday. Let's go home and uh, and enjoy our day off. Sounds like a good idea. Thanks for joining us, and we'll talk to you next weekend as we talk with Freddie Smith. It's back again this year. Make memories at Quicker Steak and Lube on Monday, December 16th, and have dinner with Santa. Mr. and Mrs. Claus love the lube, and your family will too, with free photos with Santa. And the kids could win one of three Razor scooters we're giving away. Don't forget, stock up on the lube gift cards, the perfect stocking stuffer. Dinner with Mr. and Mrs. Claus, Monday, December 16th from 5 until 8 p.m. And don't forget, kids eat free with an adult purchase. Quaker Stick and Lube, next to the Mid-America Center, Council Bluffs. Are you looking to book your next outing? Look no further than Joe's Carding in Council Bluffs, located just 